Hey everyone. Um, so today we're releasing Reward Bench, uh, or yesterday, depending when I get around to this video. I want to just do a little walkthrough on what we built and why I think it is interesting. So yes, we've joined to the leaderboard craze, but hopefully this one is something that is needed. Centrally, I'll take, after this brief intro, I'll do the um, story behind this. So Reward Bench is ultimately trying to be the first toolkit and data set for evaluating reward models. Reward models are very important to RLHF. The whole direct preference optimization thing and open alignment has distracted people from that, but at the big labs, reward models still matter a lot and we need to evaluate them. The second reason, which is into the story that I'll tell, is that they are where people think that the human preferences and values are being encoded, but we'll get to that more in a second. Essentially what reward bench is, is a, a leaderboard of reward models, both classifiers and DPO models. And what we did is we tried to grab all the popular DPO models, can't take all of them because there's so many, and then literally almost all the reward models we could find. I had paste, posted a collection on the hub of reward models at one point, and it was very bleak. But now you can just get them from here. You don't need to go to that collection anymore. There's basic things like search and and stuff in here, but it has our final leaderboard, which is the actual valuation ranking is this average score. I'll tell you how you compute that later. But there's a ton of data in here across different subsets, and it's not really worth going into all of them in the video, but you can kind of see that we evaluate a lot of things from chat, um, hard chat, like trick questions, essentially that's what that is, uh, safety, whether or not the models refuse what they should, reasoning, math and code, and then the prior test data, which is like Anthropic HH, learning to summarize, things like that. So this is kind of the home base for everything Reward Bench. You should come here if you have any questions, all the links are up here, and you can look through all this data. For an example of kind of what the data is, you can see we have this selection tool that shows you a random sample, and these are some of the harder questions, which are the trick questions. It's something like, if I had a box of crayons and a sheet of paper, how many apples do I have? And the chosen answer is it's not able to determine the information, and the rejected one is where it actually tries to give an answer. And we have to see which ones reward models think is better. So it's kind of teasing out if reward models are good for attribution in this case, but there's a lot more to get into. So let's try to go to the background of why reward models. I've been writing about this for a while. My background in electrical engineering is, makes me very familiar with kind of the notion of cost and optimal control. So in optimal control, you had things like cost functions, which is used to fly airplanes, drive cars, which is essentially like this optimal problem that you think you can get a solution from. This article is kind of explaining why costs and rewards or preferences are all very different. Preferences are ultimately very messy, which is why I think we need evaluations dedicated to them. And this argument essentially evolved over time. So this was in March. In April, I was talking about, of last year, how I was talking about how we needed access to one of these for these basic reasons that finally I'm getting back to today, almost a year later. And then much more recently, I started getting the marketing campaign going. So over a month ago already, is talking about why reward models are so important and the kind of role that they play in differentiating information and the weird behaviors that they can govern. This is mostly motivated by the fact that no one talks about reward models. Reward models are ultimately the place by which, uh, where which preferences are encoded. And given the societal and kind of sociological implications of that, we really need to open them up. And it's very odd because opening them up does not have as much of a business bottom line. So it makes me think that not opening these up in a big way is that these tech companies are worried about the liability of what showing a reward or um, preference model will show. So a lot of these blog posts read and led into this paper of mine, and I'm going to post all the links that I show here in the show notes for this YouTube video. So this kind of led into this paper on the history and risks of RL and human feedback. And essentially this paper is a extremely long historical argument as to why reward models are important from a taxonomy point of view and why we are ignoring them and what sorts of questions we should ask. So this paper kind of goes through and dictates um, the history of RLHF and certain assumptions that are held in this process and presumptions by people like me that are just training these models without really thinking about them, what those presumptions are as we go through here. So I have another video that I will link in the show notes about that explains this paper in detail. But essentially, RLHF is very messy, and the reward model acts as this central point. So if you know anything about RL, you have these kind of feedback loops. I don't know if this, this page has any. Let me look. 
uh, no feedback loops here, but here you have these feedback loops in RL, and RL is designed around the environment providing a stable reward function, a reward function that's clearly clear at differentiating what is a good and bad signal from the agent. And in RLHF, we're kind of co-designing the agent and the reward, so we have to be really careful that we're not messing anything up, because if you're doing this co-design process, it's really easy to lie to yourself and get this over-optimization that people talk about a lot with reward models. But no one really evaluates it other than in the training part, but we need to evaluate them as a standalone artifact. So this kind of leads us to this paper, which is evaluating reward models, where we kind of go through and describe all of this. I think it was bigger. We describe all of this background. We show how we just compute an accurate prediction or not for reward models. So we kind of have these two prompts, a chosen and a rejected. And we think that the score of the chosen answer should be higher than the score of the rejected answer. So we did a lot of manual curation of data for this project. So the data should be such that, that that is true. If there's any bugs, feel free to let us know. And then essentially we created a data set over these five, these five subsets, trying to cover a broad and general notion of what a reward model should be good at. It is corresponded of a whole bunch of subsets of these sections from various existing evaluation data sets like Alpaca Eval and MT Bench or some lesser known ones like OLM bar, or some of these safety data sets like excess test, excuse me, do not answer. Um, human value pack was really good for coding questions because they had an example that had a bug already. So we could just plug this into reward models and see if they notice bugs. But this is quite a long paper, you can see. There's a lot of details. We have this leaderboard printed here. There's a lot of details on kind of the shape of the results of reward model predictions, and really so much more. So. The paper is really for the detailed version, and I'll upload a talk on that uh, later, but this is more of an implementation level. So what we have is this is the actual data set with pairs of chosen and rejected things. It's pretty straightforward. There's prompts, and then there's two completions for each prompt. This data set goes through a reward model, and then it gets outputted in this large directory of just freaking outputs for every model. So we share all the outputs in public so people can do more data analysis of reward models. You can do things like plotting the distribution of reward models over a certain preference data set. That's all good. And really where most of this magic happens is in this reward bench code base. There's two things that I think are most important about this code base. One, how easy it is to add and compare more models. And two, how easy it is for you to add another data set to this. So those are the kind of two things I want to get across when looking at the code. Mostly that's because how people are, that's how people are going to use reward bench. So if you look, scroll through here, this heading is pretty similar. It points out that we kind of have these two key scripts for evaluation. We can start there. So we go scripts, run RM and run DPO are very similar. RM is for standard reward models. DPO is for DPO models, which essentially need a reference model to be run. We're doing more research on if you need the reference model, but for now it looks like you do. And then this is just a pretty basic script that loads a model with hugging face, loads a data set, we'll talk about the data set more later, and then just does batched inference over the whole data set. You can kind of see with the transformers pipeline here, or you can kind of have a for loop over your batch. It's pretty normal stuff. Get the rewards, and then you essentially decide if your reward was higher than uh, for the chosen sample or the rejected sample, and then we have a bunch of data set saving. It's pretty simple stuff. Um, DPO, we can go look at this, it looks pretty similar. You can generally see that the difference is that you have ref reference models here, but it's all pretty similar. If we go into the actual source code for DPO, this is kind of a nice section. So this is essentially the DPO code from TRL with all of the training components stripped out so you don't save any of the gradients as the TR TRL would do. And there's a lot more kind of little things on the margin that are handled with training, whether it's with deep speed and stuff like that, that we didn't need to do for this. Kind of a lightweight introduction to DPO. Let's see, we can find the core part here. So like here you can see once you have the log probs, you're, you're getting the log ratios, which are the reward for DPO. We can see this in the paper. This is one of the things that I liked about the paper is we actually put the math in here for how you compare two responses with a reward model versus a, deep, a classifier versus DPO. So a classifier has this loss function where you're increasing the margin here, which is equation two. And then I wonder if I have highlight with this. I have draw. I don't have highlight. And then that makes sense because the reward is then proportional to the typo that I'm going to fix. A reward is then proportional to 
the probability that y is chosen. So when you pass in one answer, what the reward model is trying to do is trying to predict the probability that that's the chosen response of a pair that was trained in a batchwise fashion. DPO is much more nuanced. The DPO in the paper, if you plug in that policy that they solve for, it ends up with this implicit reward function that is a scaled ver ratio of these log probs and this partition function z, z cancels out. And what we end up doing is we're comparing the log probs with the reference model between two completions to a prompt. We have this y1, y2. And this is something that I haven't seen in a paper before because it's kind of nice to see this. And that's what's happening in this DPO code. This DPO code is here. It's nice to not have to redo any of this because we have it all from TRL. And you can see that we're starting to experiment with things that are um, what happens if you don't have a reference model because DPO reward models essentially take twice as much GPU compute if we can't get this reference free to work. Early results show that for this reason, DPO reward models are not always worth it. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's the kind of introduction to reward bench. And then there's, a two, there's two things like I said you need to know is one is how to um, add a reward model. So here we go here, if we go into reward bench. There's utilities and data. That's the kind of stuff that keeps stuff going. Utilities is where the data stuff is. And then models is this directory where we have all the custom models. So for each of these custom models, I mostly got the, let's go to one random one. Let's go to Starling. Mostly what happens is I took this um, code from the model card here. So we take this model card code and we actually implement it in a library where you can do it for a bunch of them. So this is Starling, which is really strong reward models. There's other ones, even like Open Assistant, which was from some of the first experiments with reward models. They also needed custom code. Really like all of these require custom code. So having them all in one place and work in the same abstraction was really useful for making um, reward models. So how we're doing this now is, for example, we're trying to reproduce Ultra RM in some of our experiments with PPO. And it turns out that like even Ultra RM needs some chat template work. So we had to copy the chat template into our library, but it makes it much easier to evaluate this and compare it to other um, reward models on the hub. So there's a place to start. If you want to contribute your model and it needs custom code, this is where you go. And the second thing is data. So we have set up data utilities to load our evaluation data sets, which is this kind of core data set that I was telling you about with like chat, chat hard safety and reasoning. And then there's a few others, like one is this large um, prior test sets data set. So we should see, here it is, it's linked here. This is things like the anthropic data, learning to summarize, um, Stanford human preferences. This is all the stuff that had test sets that people were used to using, but people weren't training that great of reward models with just this. So we needed to expand to what reward bench is doing. So we kind of have these things, we have this in here. The core kind of thing is you, you won't see a custom data set flag yet in reward bench. We're going to add this so you can just point to a hugging face data set in the right schema and you'll get the scores out. But that's the kind of thing you know is that you can easily do this. The code is just slightly needs to be slightly modified so you can open a PR and help us set up various data sets. Why this is nice is because if you have something like ultra RM that's trained on ultra feedback, it doesn't have a test set, but you could still see the agreement on the training set for various models in your batch. And like that and the Nectar are these two really popular training data sets that we haven't had training preference data sets that we haven't had much evaluation on. So adding support for things like this to reward bench is gonna come. We have normal things like a Docker file or file scripts for launching and stuff like that. So that's good. Hopefully that is helpful to people trying to can look at the code and know a place to start. You'll see there's a lot more coming soon stuff in here. We have a bunch of scripts for analysis on actually plotting results and getting results in a table, either Markdown or LaTeX. So that's good. We can kind of look at this and look at some results that I find interesting. So this Berkeley, this model is coming soon. It's not yet public. It's just a YeChat 34B model is our strongest thing. And what you can see is we can filter by the classifier models or DPO models or custom classifiers. Overall, it looks like a mix. It looks like DPO is strong, but that's because people train more DPO models than they train reward models. And really what happens is that DPO is really strong on kind of these chat hard and reasoning tasks, which are correlated with preference and instruction chat tasks that people are trying to um, excel at. But these prior test sets, the things that people used to look at, like Anthropic Harmless, Anthropic Helpful, learning to summarize, these DPO models are all at the bottom. So that's one big takeaway is DPO is doing something very different on these prior test sets than these classifier models. And then 
in the details, there's a lot more to see. So you can see all of these. I think the most interesting ones are around safety. So there's a big discrepancy of models if they refuse correctly or not. There's kind of the clear trio of models that want to refuse everything, which is not very helpful. There's models that want to answer everything, which don't do refusals to really obviously bad stuff. And then there's the sweet spot, which is models that refuse things that we like, want them to refuse and answer things that we want them to answer. So the fact that there's all represented, so here I can kind of find some in here. So you can kind of look through these last four columns. At the top is obviously the good models, but some of them are a little different. So like here's a model that this fourth row refuses, doesn't always refuse the correct things, but always responds. So that's like a helpful model. It's gonna be like a Zephyr. Yeah, the Zephyr model is very helpful. It doesn't really do the refusals quite correctly, but we can also find things that don't necessarily respond right. So like here's a model that has high refusals you can see my cursor, and then um, low response rate. So this over refuses. So that's this um, Quen Chat model, actually, which is interesting. People might not have expected that. But there's a lot more to dig into here. I hope you check out the paper. It's kind of a brief intro. I'll have a more formal talk on the channel with slides um, coming soon. I can kind of share some sneak peeks in here, too. Some of the interest is the same table, but some interesting things is like, this is like the 7 billion parameter only table. And these are some tables that show scaling. It's really easy to see that scaling will pay off in reward models. That's not surprising. You can see this with the Tulu models and the 7B models. There's a really wide range of performance in reward models. So submit your models to this. Let us know what you think. There's a lot of work to be done in this. And thanks for watching.